Welcome to another edition of RCE. We are back with another episode with a post-SC hangover finally wearing off and going into holidays and already had some work holiday parties. I have again uh, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Wow, life is tough for you over there in Michigan. Already having holiday parties. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible, terrible. Well, that's all right. It is good. It's like you said, it's the post SC detox. You know, all the crushing deadlines of, of supercomputing are past, and we're heading right into the end of year roundup here. So we figured do a couple more recordings, and then uh, well, I think we're gonna. The plan is to release one, and the next one will be next year, right? Yep, yep. This will be the last recording for 2012, and we already have lined up recordings for 2013. So let's cool. roll uh, into our guest here. Um, our guest this time is Stuart Martin from University of Chicago. He is one of the people working on the Globus Toolkit. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz around Globus and implementation and stuff recently, so I'd like to get into the details of what Globus is. Uh, Stuart, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Hi, Jeff. Can everyone? Uh, yeah, Stuart Martin. Uh, I've been working on the Globus Toolkit project for about 15 years. I've been employed from Argonne and University of Chicago at present um, <clears throat> and started with the toolkit in the early days uh, when it first uh, first few lines of code were written. So uh, what is the toolkit? seems like there's a lot of pieces to it. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the toolkit comes as uh, right, a number of components that uh, work together. Um, there's The toolkit really is uh, middleware, uh, software plumbing, you know, for high-performance file transfer, uh, cross-organization security, uh, remote job management. Um, so those are kind of the main parts to it, uh, remote uh, login as well, um, and, and uh, middleware, as I said, uh, for, for it's really designed for developers in communities like RNG Physics, uh, LIGO, uh, Earth Systems Grid, Open Science Grid, uh, basically to integrate into their custom end-to-end -end solutions to use the toolkit for that. So I actually learned about a lot of the pieces of Globus under different names. Uh, could you go cover some of these names at the big pieces? Right. So for, so for high-performance file transfer, there's Grid FTP, um, and then... Uh, for security, for the cross-organization security, there's uh, Global Security Infrastructure, GSI. Uh, My Proxy is a service to provide proxies for, for um, users and services. Um, and then there's OpenSSH, uh, SSH uh, using GSI for, uh, for secure login. Um, and then for remote job management, there's GRAN, uh, Grid Resource Allocation uh, Management. Uh, that's what that stands for. Uh, so those are, yeah, those are the main pieces in the toolkit and the names. So what's the, the history of Globus? You, you kind of implied in your intro there that it's been around for a while. You said you've even wrote some of the, the first lines of it long ago. What, uh, how did this all start and where's it going? So, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, maybe it's to start back in 1995 or so, like at Supercomputing Conference, uh, there was this iWay project, and it was basically like a one-week experiment at supercomputing to build a national-scale uh, grid uh, with major computing facilities uh, uh, with their high-speed networks, virtual reality, cave displays, you know, with approximately 60 applications as demonstration. Um, so basically it was, you know, an event that galvanized uh, what became the grid computing path, really, uh, with... Uh, Ian Foster, Steve Tiki, uh, Warren Smith, Johnson, Jonathan Geisler. Uh, basically, yeah, I don't know, you can almost say it was Globus Toolkit uh, negative one version. And then in 1996, uh, we got a DARPA grant uh, to actually fund the Globus Toolkit. Uh, and that got us kind of started. Uh, and then over the years, we've gotten funding from National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, uh, NASA, uh, NIH, We've had even private companies, uh, IBM, Sun, Intel, uh, fund, uh, you know, parts of it uh, at times. Um, and so, I don't know, in the late 1990s or early 2000, uh, you know, we, GT really got traction with the high energy physics community and LIGO, you know, as a fundamental 
uh, you know, part used in their uh, custom solutions that is integrated into their custom solutions. So um, <clears throat> I know maybe over the last five years, uh, it's really transitioned into a stable production service for um, tens of thousands of users, you know, per day installed on thousands of servers worldwide. Um, I mean, another thing in our usage statistics, we see, you know, over a hundred, over over one petabyte per day moved using Grid FTP, uh, uh, and we see several hundred thousand jobs per day using uh, Gram for job submission. So, so you use the word grid in there a lot, and uh, grid's one of those buzzwords that's been around for a long time. Could you expand in the globus world exactly what grid means? <clears throat> right, grid is is a term that's used for you know uh, an organization building a a um, out an infrastructure that you know will serve their scientific uh, com- community researchers um, to to do things easily across an, a set of computers. So you've got grids uh, in the U.S. for like Open Science Grid and Exceed. Um, Exceed's maybe a set of uh, 10 to 12 sites or in machines. Uh, Open Science Grid, I think, is more on the order of, well, actually, I'm not sure, but 20 and maybe maybe 100 resources and machines. So it's kind of like assembly you know, of smaller communities, uh, universities throughout the United States. Um, Largely, um, and then Europe has grids, and so what the grid is is making it right easy for scientists that would maybe normally use just one machine uh, to be able to harness maybe a sets sets of machines and be more opportunistic to use a variety of computers where otherwise they would have to implement some of the remote interactions on their own, and grids provide that standard uh, remote interaction to then use those remote computers more easily. Okay, so you've given a, uh, a few illusions there of, of who uses these grids. So you're talking about scientists, but you've also talked about developers as well, particularly with the, the toolkit aspect of it. So could you tell me, uh, let's focus on the toolkit part of this here. Who is the toolkit for? Who uses it? And how is it used? <clears throat> right, so, um, so the... The toolkit, you know, who uses the toolkit is, um, you know, thousands of installations worldwide. And these, these are like grids, as we've said. So, you know, uh, so Europe, in Europe, there's a comparable institution like Trace, which has a set of, of, of um, com- supercomputing resources, typically, or university compute cluster resources assembled together to make it easier for scientists to do things. The scientists would do all disciplines from high energy physics to um, uh, chemistry, computations, genome searching, um, uh, you know, all, all disciplines really. It's, it's, it's not targeting one. So, so I guess the toolkit and grids maybe are, uh, tend to be infra- infrastructure to enable a variety of then um, end user custom solutions for the different disciplines. Okay, so let's let's talk about some of the individual parts and what, what's unique about them. So let, let's start with Grid FTP because I think that's the one that's probably the best well known. Um, what exactly is Grid FTP and why should someone use it over traditional file transfer methods? <clears throat> right, so um, so Grid FTP is high performance file transfer service. I mean, it's not just a simple upload download manager, uh, you know, and it's. And it's not a tool where there's always a human in the loop. Um, you know, it might, it might, it's something where you can write delegate credentials and then offline a service can do things on your behalf. Um, and so it has elements of, you know, reliability and security uh, in large scale environments. Um, you know, basically, uh, and uh, grid FTP itself is, is a set of en- of enhancements on top of FTP. Uh, so some of these enhancements for Grid FTP are um, well, they have uh, security um, extensions to FTP, uh, and then also parallelism, uh, pipeline, uh, file offset markers for restartability. 
Now, when you say pipelining and, and parallelism, can you go into a little bit uh, about what you mean there? Are you talking parallelism across multiple network links, for example? Right. So parallelism is the uh, ability to uh, do multiple TCP streams uh, to a single process. So, uh, and then that, that, by doing it that way, you can, you know, send data much faster. So there was this thing called a striped grid FTP server. What exactly is that? Right. So, so striping with grid FTP is, is a way to send, uh, basically, uh, I would boil it down to one file, uh, extremely fast over the, over the network. So striping is that, um, uh, basically transfer a portion of a single file at the same time using multiple grid FTP processes and then and then transfer a single file to it to a single file but over the network you're really breaking up that file into multiple um, uh, processes and TCP streams uh, to then bring it back to a single file okay so with the stripe servers um, when I had done it I had actually used multiple machines and an exceed site is that a common setup right um, good point so uh, yes, um, many do uh, use that method, uh, and um, right can achieve really high bandwidth uh, throughput uh, using that method. Okay, so how does authentication get handled in all this? You said that it might not necessarily involve human intervention. What? How is authentication handled in something? Right. So <clears throat> one um, why, one of the components, uh, the GSI. Uh, security infrastructure in the toolkit uh, allows for uh, the delegated credentials. Delegation is a key uh, thing identified and that would be needed with these types of services and grids. Uh, so that way, uh, a user can come on and and um, they don't have to be present all the time. And then services can do things on their behalf. So. <clears throat> uh, so right, so then you delegate a, you can delegate a credential uh, to a service uh, using uh, X509 and security uh, standards and my proxy and Globus and GSI uh, implement these standards uh, to implement delegation. <laughs> so. How is this different than, say, you know, just plain vanilla passwords or SSH keys or, or a technology like that? It's similar in some ways in that with SSH, you need to, you know, put a key on the remote machine. And with uh, credentials and uh, GSI, um, you do need to you get a, you're, you get a unique ID, uh, a DN, uh, with your credential. And then that needs to be put in a grid map file. But there's also more... Um, complex ways that you can um, set up authorization and, and like CA logon and uh, other technologies are coming on where uh, a, your access at your campus uh, can be used to then access remote machines on like a group um, authorization. So it's much easier than getting access at a site that if a site wants to enable a set of researchers from University of Chicago or a set of researchers from University of Michigan, uh, that can be done at a, at a larger scale and is more uh, uh, resilient to changes uh, for various personnel. The, the, the authorization can be handled at the institution. I see. And so GSI is the part of the Globus Toolkit that allows this to happen in kind of a uniform, uh, standardized way across multiple different organizations. That's kind of the key here, Right. Right. And in GSI, you know, again, what the toolkit provides is a little bit of plumbing that then my proxy kind of implements as a on top of it as a uh, as a service. OK, so there's this thing called Gram and distributed resource management and such. Can you go into what that is and how it works? Right. So <clears throat> one thing that uh, scientists, you know, do is they can log in and use a remote supercomputer uh you know, on that computer, there's usually a, some type of a batch uh, scheduler, some uh, something to, uh, you know, allow all scientists to submit their jobs that they would like done and to schedule all of them across these large supercomputers. Um, and what Gram does is basically provide a remote interface to that uh, service, to that local service. 
Um, so it it will uh, allow you to submit jobs from remote and cancel jobs and uh, and do that securely. Okay, so does this sit on top of the local sites, the local resource providers, resource manager and such? So you still use PBS or LSF or something like that? And then yeah, Graham talks key, to that? Right. One key uh, distinction we did early on was that we would not require this to like be something that a local site would have to um, uh, change their local system to adopt, that Graham works on top of uh, the local system so that you can add it if you'd like. Local users can still use their local access, but then remote, this enables a new capability to um, to then interface with that uh, machine and system uh, from remote so they can do these remote jobs. So when you say the gram sits on top, what does it do? do? Do you actually interact at an API level with the underlying schedules or just basically invoke CLI commands on behalf of remote users, or how does that work? Right. So um, there's kind of like a layer in RAM that is for interacting with the machine, with the remote, uh, with the like supercomputer and that uh, batch interface. Um, and typically it's done through, uh, right, the command line interfaces that are uh, enabled by or allowed, uh, offered in the, um, in the remote batch scheduler. Uh, so, like, you know, Q, Q sub for PBS and QSTAT, these, these commands are typically what Gram uses. Um, additionally, it could use uh, APIs and things, but uh, that's, that typically hasn't been done. It, it's, it seems to be easier to implement things with the command line tools. Okay, and then how well, how much do you expose the local policy to remote users? Because every site has a different religion about how things are scheduled and where you're allowed to run and how long. And, you know, we actually had a previous show uh, talking about three entirely different models from three different institutions about how they run their HPC resources. How do you expose that to remote users, but preserve some degree of commonality, um, you know, to preserve this ease of use that you're, you're clearly going for? Right. <clears throat> I mean, I think the most common way is that this queues. You can set up remote. You can set up queues in most all batch schedulers uh, that I know, and that's one way they can they can provide uh, some some similar uh, submission, but yet some control and some uh, segregation if they want the different jobs. And Graham can interface to those queues as well to uh, to allow users to specify those queues and, and then submit to those queues. Okay, so Graham's submitting these jobs to all these different remote things. You're tying together all these different remote resources a user may have access to. Does the user actually have to have a local account on every machine, or does Graham run them as like a Globus user? Yes, uh, you do need a local account at the at the remote machine, um, and you need authors to be authorized and accepted, just like you would any other user. And then this just enables a new capability for you. If instead of logging in locally, you could then uh, do remote, and you could maybe take advantage of other uh, grid client tools that are more high end uh, for for your your needs. So when I let's say I'm a remote scientist and I want to submit a job to your organization through you know various globus kinds of commands, how does my executable get to your organization and, and any support input files and then output files and things like that? Does this all kind of happen under the covers via grid FTP and delegation and things, or do I have to kind of pre-stage everything? Uh, users do different things. Uh, they um some will stage uh, themselves through grid FTP. Uh, maybe some files are already staged. Uh, maybe if they're very large files, they'll stage them by hand, uh, you know, individually. And, and then maybe as a process, stage some files through again grid FTP and then submit their job and then stage some, some back. Uh, in addition, through Gram, it, it provides the also staging capability before and after job. Uh, so, you can do it a variety of ways, and users do it differently um, depending on their needs. Okay, so Graham does a lot of things. Um, 
In which cases should gram be used, and which cases should gram not be used? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, uh, I mean, gram, you know, what, some will use gram to submit uh, every one of their jobs. Uh, in some cases, maybe where you get uh, you, um, short-running jobs, then um, some users will, uh, and you have many short-running jobs, uh, you know, some users will use Gram as more of a pilot job. And basically, you know, what that is, something like maybe Condor G, which is kind of a high-level high client to manage a, 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 a personal queue of jobs uh, that then would submit a j one job through Gram to start up kind of a remote Condor uh, daemon. And then Condor would talk directly to the daemon. So it's a way to kind of bootstrap maybe your own uh, chosen, um, you know, grid client method for submitting jobs uh, down into the supercomputing cluster. Okay, let me switch direction here a little bit. Um, I'm an open source developer kind of guy, and um, I know that you have quite the community around uh, all this development effort too. Can you tell us a little bit about how your community is organized? Uh, what's your role? How do you guys make decisions? Things like that. <clears throat> yeah, so, so right, we're uh, open source and have been from the beginning. Uh, so we've interacted with various communities that kind of have come and go. Uh, and and we've done things. I mean, I, don't know, I guess we've changed over the years. You know, we uh, we haven't always been agile Scrum. That's kind of come along more recently. But um, so we maintain uh, open mailing lists. So in the um, uh, Globus Toolkit user uh, email list, Globus Toolkit uh, de developer email list, uh, commit list. So you can see our commit commits if you'd like to, and you can plug in wherever you'd like to get uh, information. So that's one way of distributing information between users. And we have, you know, hundreds of users uh, uh, subscribe to these lists. Um, so we communicate that way. And then um, uh, we maintain our, 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 our backlog of tasks in JIRA and kind of like choose a set of tasks to do each sprint. We kind of run two-week sprints. Um, so... Uh, you know, with that, uh, you, um, you know, have a meeting uh, every two weeks, kind of review what was done, uh, set the next priorities, um, you know, choose the next set of uh, tasks to do and, and put those into uh, sprint buckets, really, of two weeks. And so that's out there to be seen as well in, in JIRA, that the toolkit project is open uh, there. And... Um, uh, uh, anybody who would like to take a look and take a look at what we're doing on a on a daily, weekly basis. So now you say you do uh, you know an agile uh, sprint kind of development style. Do you do you do this every two weeks? Do you have a, a sprint every two weeks, or is it more a methodology of you're just making uh, two week bites of work, so to speak, that gets distributed around the community? Right. So we we do we do. Two, pretty religiously, two weeks, uh, two week sprints, and come together. And it's kind of the time to you know have that meeting to review what was done and and what's next. Uh, and then certainly things can run you know th tasks or efforts of work that run past two weeks. You know you you just break it up into smaller chunks and you know get the design done and then get the implementation phase one done and another sprint and you know just kind of pound through all the work in order to. Uh, you know, complete complete the job in you know and more of a larger long term scale as as some things take a, a longer term longer time to implement. Do you get a lot of commits from outside the University of Chicago space? Like, how spread around the country are you guys? Um, <clears throat> well, we work pretty closely with uh, <clears throat> the open science grid uh, community uh, and their developers and their and their team that deploys uh, a open science grid specific solution and they and they use uh, they base uh, their solution in part on, on Globus toolkit. So they maintain many patches and communicate some of those you know patches then back to us. Uh, 
And so that's very helpful in, in making the toolkit then a, a better product and more reliable. And that's kind of the, how open source works, right? So, um, so that's, a, that's a healthy relationship there. And also with Exceed uh, is similar. Um, where they base uh, some of their services and, and capabilities on the Clovis toolkit. Uh, so, so we communicate uh, issues and patches with them as well. And then in Europe, uh, there's the initiative for Globus in Europe. That was a <clears throat> recently funded uh, effort to then uh, bring Globus to uh, the European community, um, a more local group in Europe uh, that support their users' needs uh, you know, answer questions maybe more uh, quickly or, you know, work more uh, closely with their community there. Uh, and really, we, we do, you know, work with grids uh, throughout the world, you know, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, Europe, uh, Prace, um, you know, U.S. Uh, so, I don't know, there really, there really are grids uh, throughout the world that are based on the toolkit. So here's a question I like to ask uh, other development and communities just for the heck of it and my own genuine curiosity. What version control system do you guys use and why? Um, right. So we've used a CVS, uh, you know, and maybe there's some newer ones out there, but we've used CVS uh, and we kind of like built some tools uh, around it to, to do everything we need. Um, it, you know, it provides us with uh, branching and merging and, um, uh, pretty much, you know, I guess also maybe that we've had some developers that have been on the project for, you know, 10 years, 10 plus years. So, uh, you know, what don't, we don't need to fix, we don't need to fix what isn't broken, right? Let's, let's move on to the future here. What is, the uh, coming future plans for Globus? You said it's very mature now. It's been around for a while. What, what are your plans? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if we have any uh, huge plans for the toolkit in that it's mature. Uh, it's it will evolve and will, you know, uh, and, and evolve for as the community needs. So, I mean, I guess one one also way to answer that is that you know this other effort we're doing with Globus Online, um, which uses the Globus toolkit and provides an end user capability. Um, for, for high performance file transfer, um, uh, you know the <clears throat> the toolkit, and that's a recent kind of effort. You know, a couple of years we've been doing Globus Online, and these are the types of things that uh, the toolkit enables. Uh, you know, for these type of custom high end end user um, uh, solutions that we would anticipate. You know, things you know, new things like this coming up. So the plumbing of the toolkit maybe changes little bits here and there and add some features for users, but I, I don't think there's anything um, too earth-shattering, uh, you know, that, that are, is planned at this point for the toolkit. Okay, Stuart, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can we find more information about Globus Toolkit? Uh, yeah, well, we have a website, uh, Globus.org, www.globus.org, uh, and then globus.org slash toolkit uh, to find out more about the toolkit. And then uh, also globus.org, you'll, you'll find uh, Globus Online, which you know also leverages the toolkit, and you can find out information about that for uh, end-user uh, file transfer. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. All right. Well, thank you, guys.